Hey, thanks for checking out our messages online. And let me encourage you to also go to our website, uh, check out how uh, we can further be of ministry to you. Uh, send us a note, check one of the links. We'd love to follow up with you and connect with you. Again, our prayers that you'll be blessed by the teaching of God's Word. Good morning. Man, it feels like summer, doesn't it? Yeah. I guess it's easy to say that if you're coming back from vacation like I am, but uh, great to see you this morning. Hey, we are continuing in our series on the book of Philippians. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Philippians chapter one. Uh, Philippians, one of my favorite uh, letters of Paul in the New Testament. Uh, it's only 104 verses long, and in those 104 verses over four chapters, he challenges and encourages us to rejoice or to live with joy 16 times, uh, and so it's called the epistle of joy. Just curious, how many of you had a parent growing up that from time to time, as they observed your behavior or your attitude, especially teenage years, would put the old arm on the shoulder and kind of say, we need to have a talk, right? Any, any of y'all remember any of, those, any of those talks? My dad would do it this way. He would say, son, maybe we need to go take a, a ride together. And I knew that meant, uh-oh, right? Or let's go take a walk. And usually it was, you know, he was sharing some wisdom or addressing some deficiency in, in my attitude or behavior. In many ways, that's kind of what the Apostle Paul is doing in the passage that uh, we're going to look at today. You see, Philippians was a church he planted, and he is writing from prison, but he's heard some correspondence. He's heard about some conflict in the church. Matter of fact, later in chapter 4, he's going to actually call out some names of some folks that weren't getting along. And what he's doing is he's saying, come on, guys. Um, he is having a pastoral moment of reminding them, he being in prison, reminding them in their freedom how to honor Christ and live with each other, okay? Um, So he's going to address some underlying attitudes that threaten the unity of the church and really the witness of the church. And these words are relevant for all generations, certainly relevant for our day as well. But really the the key verse that sets up the passage we're going to look at today is chapter 1, verse 27. We'll start there. Paul begins by saying, whatever happens, he's talking about whatever happens to me, and again, he's in prison, uncertain of his future. Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, okay? Then whether I come and see you, which was his intent, or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm. Notice here's here's, his desire for them. In one spirit, okay, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. In other words, I want you guys to be on the same page. I want you guys to be united. I want you guys uh, to reflect a unity that's only found in Christ. It's interesting, he says, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. What does that mean, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel? Um, when you think about conducting yourself, you're talking about what is fitting or appropriate behavior, right? Um, I'm reminded of the opposite of that. Um, those of us, those of you from a military background, might be familiar with the phrase, conduct unbecoming of an officer and a gentleman, right? Uh, part of the military code, matter of fact, Article 133, in case you're wondering. Um, And here's the definition of that. It says, conduct unbecoming is understood to include dishonest acts, displays of indecency, lawlessness, dealing unfairly, indecorum, injustice, or acts of cruelty, right? 
What Paul is saying is as we walk with Christ and as we follow Christ, there should be certain things about our behavior. There should be certain things about our attitudes that would reflect the person of Jesus. And he's saying we are to conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of Christ. That word conduct is actually where we get the word citizen from. If you know the background, Paul was a Roman citizen, and that was a privilege in that day. He's writing to a church in Macedonia, and most of them were Roman citizens there, and he's saying, you have a higher citizenship than even that of a Roman citizen. You are a citizen of the kingdom of God. You are, you belong to Christ. Um, I know probably most of us uh, know and love or remember Steve Stegg, our executive, our former executive pastor retired last year during COVID. My favorite Steve Stegg saying, and he had a bunch of them, by the way, but my favorite one that he would share with the staff is whenever he would, like, we would leave or leave a meeting or go, he'd say, hey, remember who you are and who you represent. Um, and what he was saying was, you know, Remember, you belong to Christ. Remember that you have influence. Remember that you set an example. And so, you know, my dad used to say, hey, Chuck, you're a Martin. And Martin's behaving this way. Remember, in a sense, who you are and who you represent. That's what Paul is saying. He said, remember that you represent Christ. Why did he choose the gospel when he says, live in a manner worthy of the gospel? Well, the gospel Basically, is the good news of God's undeserved love, acceptance, and forgiveness in Christ, right? What Paul is saying is don't ever get over the fact that you are the recipient of God's love and grace. In other words, what Paul is saying, remember, this is not something you achieve. The gospel is something you received. And Paul is reminding each of us that we We come to God on the basis of what he has done for us in Christ, not on our own merit. In other words, don't get, as my dad used to say, don't don't get too big for your britches, right? In other words, remember, remember what God has done for you in Christ. The gospel says I'm accepted and forgiven on the basis of what Jesus has accomplished for me, not on my own effort or moral achievement. Matter of fact, I want to begin by looking at three kind of, uh, in a sense, um, three ways that the gospel shapes how we are to treat each other, okay? How we're to relate to each other. And the first is, is, should be pretty obvious, but I'll start with it. And we're going to see he, he, um, he illustrates this in the passage. The first thing is the gospel humbles me. It reminds me that I'm undeserving of God's love and acceptance. The gospel humbles us right? The gospel reminds us that we're sinners, uh, that we are undeserving of God's love and forgiveness, that God chooses to love and forgive us. It's not based on our merit. It's not based on our achievement or our our behavior. It's in spite of that. It humbles me. I love what Ephesians chapter 2 says when Paul writes, uh, I like the way the New Living Translation says, he He's talking about our life before Christ. He said, all of us used to live in that way, and there was a way we lived before Christ, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else, or to his wrath, some translations will say. But God, who is so rich in mercy and loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when we were raised uh, in Christ, raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you've been saved. Paul's reminding us of that. The gospel is not that I'm better than you are. The gospel is not that I'm more righteous. The gospel is really not about me. It's about God's mercy to me, right? And that is the starting point. It's a reminder. We have to remind ourselves of that because here's the deal. The longer we walk with Christ, there's certain behaviors that perhaps at one point... Um, we struggle with more. As you mature in Christ, perhaps your language cleans up. Perhaps your behavior uh, is modified. It should be, right? Part of maturing. And as you look back, you'll go, wow, I was a knucklehead before, right? I'm maybe less of a knucklehead now. In other words, I'm responding in more mature ways. I'm, I'm hopefully handling anger and things better than I did. But in other words, there should be some progression, right? I'm, you get this, right? 
we should be improving, shall I say, right? Well, here's the temptation. The longer you walk with Christ, the easier it is for us to look at where we are today and forget where we came from, but also then also, in a sense, feel a sense of pride at where we are in comparison either to our former self or to you. What Paul is saying is, (laughs) no, not at all. Living in a manner worthy of the gospel begins by saying, I am unworthy of the gospel. In other words, God's grace in my life, whatever maturity, whatever development, whatever, whatever gifting, whatever work of the Spirit in my life is a work of grace. He's reminding us of that because we need reminding. Second thing he says, the gospel enables me to be more gracious to you since God has been gracious with me. It's kind of the key to being gracious toward you is reminding me of God's graciousness toward me, right? I mean, it's not complicated. I can be patient with you and I realize how patient God has been with me. Uh, But if I forget how God is patient and kind to me, then I'll be impatient and unkind to you, right? And that is the attitude that he drills down on. Um, Tim Keller says we need to remind ourselves of the gospel daily. You never outgrow your need to be reminded of the gospel of Jesus. That God loved you in Christ when you were undeserving and a rebel against him, right? Um, I love the quote of Tim Keller. He says, the gospel is that I'm so flawed that Jesus had to die for me. Yet I'm so loved and valued that Jesus was glad to die for me. This leads to a deep humility and a deep confidence at the same time. I love that. I cannot feel superior to anyone, yet I have nothing to prove to anyone. I cannot, and excuse me, I do not think more of myself or less of myself. Instead, I think of myself less, right? You see, that the way you know that you're progressing, in a sense, in your maturity in Christ is your self-awareness, not in the sense that you, you know, behave in inappropriate ways, but your self-awareness goes down and your awareness of the needs of others goes up. In other words, you think more of others than you think of yourself. That's one way that you know that you're moving in a different direction is you think about what Other people are going through. You think about them, not just yourself. It is part of maturity. You know this as a parent, don't you? I mean, as a parent with our kids, we would we would teach them when they're very little. Okay, no, this. And they would go, well, what's you know, what did I get? Look, my sister got that, or my brother got that. What am I going to get? Kind of thing, right? It's immaturity of a kid. And as a parent, we would always say, every dog has his day. This is your sister's day. This is, we're doing this for your sister. It's not about you or vice versa. This is about your brother. It's not about you. I mean, we do this, right? As parents, you get this. You're trying to help your kid to not grow up and be a self-centered, egotistical, entitled brat, right? And by the way, um, there are a lot of those being produced in this community, I'll save that for another message, okay? (laughs) But here's the truth. Unless someone of maturity speaks truth into our life, the default of every one of us is to be self-centered. I remember a conversation my dad had with me when I was about 12 years old. Here's a picture of that time. It's a picture taken later in the summer. That's me on the left. I was about 11 years old, I guess, at the time. And the guy on the right is named Bobby. Let me tell you about Bobby, okay? Bobby and I went fishing, and there's a picture of our fishing trip. Bobby was from New Jersey, and he moved to Anniston, Alabama for the summer to spend the summer with his aunt, who was a member of our church. My mother decided that Bobby needed a friend, and so she volunteered me to be that friend, okay? I was not part of this agreement. I was not in on this. I was not... I was not an endorser of this agreement, yet I did not have a choice in the matter. Any of y'all remember this kind of thing? She said, no, you are going to be, you're going to spend some time with Bobby. So I spent time with Bobby. Well, when I was Bobby, he was from New Jersey. 
And all he talked about was New Jersey. Oh, how great New Jersey. How great New Jersey. And I was just like, I'm sick of hearing in New Jersey. I kind of like Alabama. And I developed a little 11-year-old attitude. The rolling of the eyes. Oh, do I have to? And you're like, okay, we're going to invite Bobby to go with us to this. Does Bobby have to come, right? And then I remember the talk about Bobby. Because my parents saw, hey, I'm not, I'm just being, I'm being a, just a little selfish, immature 11 year old. And so my mom pulled me aside and she said, Chuck, you need to know a little something about Bobby. And I'm like, yeah, I know. He's from New Jersey, he plays soccer. I mean, I know all this. Uh, he's annoying, he's like my shadow. And she said, Bobby's dad died three months ago. The reason Bobby is spending the summer here is his mom can't handle Bobby and all of the other kids. You know his aunt. She took him in. Why don't you think about how Bobby feels. What do you think it's like to lose your dad, get uprooted, spend a summer with complete strangers in a place you've never been? What do you think, would you, what would it be like to be in Bobby's shoes? And then she left this zinger. Do you think that God might use you to be a friend to Bobby this summer? I'm like, oh. 11-year-old, immature me. But that cut me. I hadn't thought about that. I was only thinking about myself. That's what 11-year-olds tend to do, by the way. Here's what Apostle Paul is writing. He's saying, there are a lot of you that are behaving like 11-year-olds. You're only thinking about yourself. Why don't you think about somebody else for a change? My attitude changed toward Bobby. It's not that we became best friends over summer, but the reason why I'm, I'm taking that picture, and I actually have a, somewhat of a smile on my face, which was, is because my attitude changed and it needed to change. That is what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, listen, you're, 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 you're focusing so much on yourself. And he's going to say, why don't you think about each other? Matter of fact, notice what he says. Philippians chapter two, verses one and two. Notice, notice what, what it says. He says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united in Christ, any comfort in his love, any common sharing in the spirit, any tenderness and compassion, verse two, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. Notice he's going to go on to say in verse three, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Wow. Wow. Not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of each other. I mean, that's in essence what my mom was saying. Why don't you think about Bobby? Why don't you think about his experience? Why don't you think about his interests? Why don't you get your eyes off yourself? And that is exactly what Paul is saying. Do nothing. That is so convicting. Put it back up there if you would for a second. Verse 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Nothing. Can I get like a little something about vain, selfish ambition? Can it kind of a little bit be about me? Paul is saying, no, because that's insatiable. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather in humility, remember where you came from. Remember God's grace. Remember the gospel. Value others above yourself. In other words, your focus, take your focus off yourself. Not looking to your own interests, but to the interest of others. 
Here's the ironic thing about that. To the degree to which we do that is the degree to which we experience joy because joy is never the result of a self-focused life. That's why those who are the most self-centered are the most miserable, by and large. <clears throat> so how do you know? Well, Paul gives us kind of a test. Not only does he say, don't, don't forget the gospel, focus on others before yourself. But the third thing <clears throat> that I'd mention is the gospel frees me from comparing myself with you and enables me to rejoice with you as God blesses your life. One of the tests you can know that you're making progress in that is are you able to rejoice when God blesses someone else's life? I mean, really rejoice. Can you genuinely be happy for them and not go, well, I would, you know, be nice if I got, right? If you can rejoice with them and celebrate with them God's blessing for them or their kids or, and you're genuinely excited about what God has done in their life without even thinking about how that may or may not be true of you, you're making progress. But one thing about self-focused people is they have a hard time celebrating somebody other than themselves. Verse 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, value others above yourself. And so what he's going to do in these verses, and we're going to read, read them again here in just a moment is he's really going to focus on the key to kind of having an other-centered or other-first attitude, really the key to unity in the church. And I'd like for us, uh, let's read it together. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. He says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, I love the way he says this. He, he is so, he's using exaggeration. If you have any encouragement from being united, is there any encouragement from being united in Christ? Any whatsoever, maybe just a little, you kind of get the sarcasm, right? If there's any comfort from his love, the fact that God loves you, does that bring any measure of comfort in your life? You can hear Paul writing. If any common sharing in this, do you have anything in common that you're saved and you're going to spend eternity together in heaven? Same Lord and Savior. Okay. Notice how he does this. <laughs> if there's any tenderness and compassion, do you have any tenderness and compassion? When you think about someone, it's just, is there something in your heart that goes, well, oh yeah, maybe, right? Then make my joy complete, being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. Notice he says, do nothing again out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. What Paul is going to say is the key to Christian unity is making your focus about Christ who has saved you and called you, his purpose in your life, and also valuing others above yourself. Let me define terms for a moment. Christian unity, if you want a definition, Christian unity is the result of God bringing people together of differing ethnicities, backgrounds, social classes into one family by faith in Christ. Our unity is based on our shared faith. It's empowered by his love. Unity is not the same thing as uniformity. He doesn't call us to be uh, have uniformity. Uh, biblical unity is not uniformity. Though we're one in Christ, God doesn't erase our unique gifts, personalities, abilities, preferences, and other distinctions like gender or age. He also doesn't erase our ethnic and cultural heritage. In other words, we can be one in Christ and yet be very different from each other. And that is the beauty of the church, is that God assembles people and you can have relationship and friendship with people that you wouldn't otherwise have friendships with. I mean, you can actually find that those in the church can be closer than even blood relatives, that you feel a bond and a kinship with people that you think, how did I meet them? Why did, they're from 
a much different background, a much different part of the country, a much different part of the world, yet we're one in Christ. That's the beauty of the church. And Paul is writing to Philippi, it's this metropolitan city, this Roman outpost, and they're Jews and they're Gentiles and they're Romans, and there's just this, this blending together of people from all walks of life. And he's saying, you can be one because of Jesus. And if there's ever a time we need to hear that, it is today. It is in Frisco, Texas. It is at first Frisco. So how do we build uh, and strengthen the unity of the church? He mentions two things, two ways we do that. The first thing he says, our unity is fueled by focusing on what we have in common in Christ. Uh, that's where he uses his sarcasm, if... Uh, you have any encouragement, any comfort in his love, if any of these things, then he says, then be of one mind, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. Focus on what you have in common with Christ. He actually asked four rhetorical questions, which I'll walk through. If any encouragement from being united in Christ, any comfort from his love, any common sharing in the spirit, any tenderness and compassion, he says, if, if any of these things are true, then make my joy complete, being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. The second thing he says is he says, unity is strengthened from an outward, an, an other's uh, first attitude, excuse me. I'll get it out in a second. Choosing to take an interest in others rather than focusing on myself. And really, that's really the heart of this passage is he's saying, I have called you together in Christ and placed you on mission there in Philippi. And so in order for you to be the church that that God desires for you to be, in order for that to happen, your focus cannot be on that which would divide you. Your focus has to be on that which unites you, and you must value others above yourself. Um, So rather than asking kind of what's in it for me, What he's saying instead, ask instead, how can I bless and serve someone else? And that is a great, great question. Um, One of the things that I did this past week when I was off from work is took a little time to to do a little bit of reading. And one of the books that, um, that was recommended to me by a pastor friend it's called Boy, The Boys in the Boat. I don't know if y'all are familiar with that or have heard the book. It was a New York, I mean, bestseller several years ago. It's a true story of the 1936 U.S. Uh, Olympic rowing team from the University of Washington, okay? They were in the 1936 Berlin Olympics, which is obviously famous for Adolf Hitler. Um, and an interesting thing, it tells a story about these young men, these college students, and the University of Washington was not known for having like this great rowing program. Instead, it was more the Ivy League schools like Yale and, you know, uh, Mass and others uh, on the East Coast. As a matter of fact, only one of the nine had ever rowed before in his life had any experience, yet the coach began to work with them and said, listen, to row together, gentlemen, you have to row as one. You have to learn to think alike. You have to be in sync with each other. You have to learn how to act, not as nine individuals, but as one. And I, I'm, I, I've never rowed really, so I don't, I'm not speaking from experience, but I read the book. Um, <laughs> And reading the book impressed me on the difficulties of being able to row in sync with each other to the degree and the level that you could compete internationally. I mean, you're talking about the same force being exerted, the same rhythm, the same mechanics, nine people on a little narrow boat balanced on the water with the oars at the precise depth simultaneously rowing and how the difficulty of learning the cadence and the rhythm and how they pull together as one, that when it works, what happens is you make progress. And as you make progress, you look around, you go, hey, this is fun. This is exciting. And here's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, church, you're called to honor Jesus together. 
You're called to be on mission with Jesus together. And that means you can't be focusing on how I'm doing over here. You can't be just doing your own thing. It's not about you. God has called you to something bigger. God has called you to a purpose. God has placed you on mission. And together we can accomplish more. Paul is saying, listen, hand over the shoulder. I see an attitude that we really need to nip in the bud. Because what I'm seeing is more about you than it is honoring the other above yourself. It needs to be more about Jesus and more about you and less about me. Easier said than done. Let's pray together. I'm going to ask that as we pray together this morning, I'd like to guide us in kind of just a, a little confession, a little prayer time together, okay? And so with our heads bowed, here, here's, here's what I'm going to ask. And certainly, I start with myself. Would you simply, right where you are, just tell God, Lord, forgive me for thinking of myself first. Lord, I know I see that in me. God, would you forgive me for selfishness, for thinking too much of myself? Would you tell him, Lord, forgive me for forgetting how undeserved your grace and love is? God, thank you for loving me when I'm just not being lovable. God, when I'm being selfish and frustrated, or when my life is not attractive, God, thank you for loving me at my worst. Lord, would you forgive me? Just tell him in your own words, Lord, would you forgive me for the tendency I have to compare myself with others? God, forgive me for for how self can be a preoccupation. God, would you call us as broken people redeemed by a Savior who bore our sin and our shame that we might be forgiven and confident in that forgiveness? But as Keller says, that we might at the same time, Lord, not feel superior to anyone else or have to prove to anyone else, to not think more of ourselves, but to think of ourselves less. Lord, by your grace, enable us to have the attitude of Jesus who went to a cross, who bore our shame, who purchased our forgiveness, and who loves us completely, just as we are, but enough to not leave us as we are. And all God's people said, amen. Hi, I'm Pastor Chuck Martin, and I want to thank you for watching our service online today. I sincerely hope it was a blessing to you and your relationship with the Lord. And if you made a decision today regarding your relationship with Christ, We'd love to know that. We'd also love to help you with any questions you have or next steps, how to deepen your relationship with Christ. Please text us with a number that's on the screen so that we can follow up with you. 
You know, we have a lot going on these days in the life of the church, and there's more detailed information on our website, friscofirst.church. We'd love to also meet you in person. And so I want to encourage you to come in person to check out a service as soon as you're able. Again, thank you for watching today. We look forward to meeting you.